Hello, my name is Jessica Azule. I'm Program Director of the Alliance for a Green Economy, and this is a presentation about a proposal being considered right now to bail out the economically struggling Ghana nuclear reactor by raising RG&E electricity rates. This presentation is brought to you by Alliance for a Green Economy. We work for safe, affordable energy and the development of a green economy in New York State. We promote a transition to a carbon-free and nuclear-free future and educate the public about alternatives that can revitalize the economy and safeguard human health and the environment. And I'm joined today in this presentation by Tim Judson. He's the Executive Director of the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. So I'm going to hand it over to Tim to give the first part of the presentation. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you everyone for tuning in uh, for this presentation. Uh, first, I want to say a little bit about NEARS. Uh, Nuclear Information and Resource Service uh, is a orga national organization uh, that was founded in 1978 to be a resource uh, for concerned people and local organizations uh, concerned about nuclear power and uh, wanting to influence the kind of energy decisions and environmental decisions that were being made in their communities. Uh, now we've grown to where we have about 45,000 members and activists and supporters across the United States, uh, including about 3,000 in New York. Um, now to kind of give a sense of uh, you know, the overview of the current situation, um, what Exelon uh, has done is proposed a, a contract uh, with, to, the New York, to, to the New York Public Service Commission. Um, and while the range of this contract is not yet settled at, this, at the time of this recording, um, the indications we have are that uh, it will come in at a price which will be 44 to 80 percent above current market prices. Uh, this will impose a steep cost on Rochester gas and electric ratepayers of uh, between 100, uh, sorry, 80 and 150 million dollars per year, um, which will have a dramatic impact on people's uh, electricity bills. Uh, on average, uh, per RG&E customer, somewhere between $18 and $34 a month. Um, this would be well in excess of any pre-existing uh, contract for a similar reliability purpose as what Exelon is arguing is necessary for Ghana, uh, you know, including uh, other power plants that are in the same general region of, of Rochester Gas and Electric uh, in uh, cent you know, central and western New York. Um, so what we would really you know, think is important is, uh, in the context of the arguments that are made for keeping Ghana online, um, is that we really need to look to the future uh, and think about uh, you know, what the future is both for this power plant and what the future um, economic and energy needs um, of the Rochester area are. That includes considerations about uh, the decommissioning of, of, of Ghana and the, and the transition for the local community, uh, ways in which uh, you know, the welfare of workers in the local community can, can be protected at the the lowest cost, and you know, with and in a, in, in a sustainable fashion going forward, um, as well as uh, you know, what sort of lower cost clean energy options might be available. Now, what has happened so far? Um, in July of 2014, Exelon filed a petition with the Public Service Commission um, and said that it would consider closing Ghana if the PSC does not authorize and mandate a contract uh, for RG&E to buy uh, Ghana's electricity um, at a high enough price that that Guinea, that uh, that it'll, it will uh, Exelon will be able to rationalize keeping it, keeping the plant going. In October. Uh, RG&E put out a, um, a request for proposals from you know for alternatives to Guinea, um, you know, with a seven-week uh, response period. This is actually very low, consider you know for for similar situations. It's a very short response period for similar situations. In November, on November 14th, the Public Service Commission ordered RG&E and Exelon to negotiate a contract uh, for the uh, you know for the continued operation of Guinea. Um, they also ordered RG&E to report back to them on uh, on the uh, the responses that they got to their RFP for for alternatives to to Guinea. On December 23rd, uh, RG&E announced that it had identified a transmission upgrade uh, that could that could shorten the period in which Ghana would be needed to provide for electricity reliability, and um, uh, the PSC had originally set a date for RG&E and Exelon to submit a proposal uh, or a proposed contract of January 15th. Uh, the the companies then asked for an extension until February 6th. And, uh, you know, beyond, so we, that's when we expect uh, Exelon and rg &E to file a proposed contract. Uh, beyond that point, we expect there will be a review process by the PSC, but we really don't know what that looks like at this point. 
So stepping back for a second, uh, how did we get here? Uh, you know, Guinea finds itself you know, sort of at the, you know, at the crossroads of a bunch of different trends that are happening um, in the energy industry right now. And uh, so it's, it's helpful to kind of understand, you know, why Guinea is, you know, uh, is in this economic situation that it's in, why it might close, um, why even, you know, with, uh, you know, this contract with rg and why uh, Guinea may eventually close sometime in the near future if it doesn't close right away. Um, so, uh, you know, there are a number of different uh, factors here. One is that electricity prices have been falling, generally speaking, for the last several years. Um, the market prices for electricity, you know, peaked um, historically in 2008, and they've been on a downward trend since there. Uh, and it's not clear that they're ever going to rebound to the levels that they were before. Uh, there is increasing levels of energy efficiency. You know, you, uh, you know, consumers, residences, businesses are using are generally using uh, less energy because people have become aware of how much more cost effective it is to you know to be more efficient. Um, also, uh, that that kind of intersects with uh, with a trend that's particular to the nuclear industry, which is that their operating costs are ri- are rising quite rapidly. Um, and as a result of that, you know, there are two plants that are very similar to Guinea uh, that have closed in the last two years. And uh, what we found sort of coincident with that is that essentially, um, you know, Rochester Gas and Electric, you know, was sort of asleep at the wheel and not really acting proactively to anticipate um, that Guinea would, uh, you know, would, would potentially close as soon as it might. So a little bit about Guinea. Um, so Guinea uh, is one of the most uh, the, one of the least cost effective uh, you know power plants in the country right now that's both because it's a nuclear power plant but also because uh, for uh, because of the kind of nuclear power plant it is um, it's the second smallest nuclear power plant in the country at 582 megawatts um, and it's also uh, one of the oldest in the world in fact it's the oldest reactor of its type still operating in the US it's the fourth oldest reactor overall in the country and it's the seventh oldest reactor that's still operating in the entire world um, those all, all those things you know sort of add to the profile of the plant which is that it's very difficult for RG and e or for Gene to, to to generate enough uh, you know electricity sales to to pay for the cost of its operation uh, so stepping back a little bit, you know, um, in terms of Guinea's history to kind of understand where Exelon comes into play, um, you know, Guinea was originally owned by Rochester Gas and Electric. It was owned and built by RG&E in uh, 1969 uh, is when the construction was completed. And it was operated, you know, essentially as part of RG&E's vertical utility monopoly, um, you know, where RG&E was both generating the electricity and delivering and selling it directly to the customers um, until the utility industry was was restructured in uh, New York State in the late 1990s. And the last phase of that restructuring for uh, for RG&E was the sale of Guinea uh, to Const to a company called Constellation in 2004. And the name Constellation is still reflected officially in, um, you know, as the owner of, of Guinea, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, but essentially, Guinea was sold to uh, to Constellation at, you know, what was even then considered a fire sale price of about $400 million, um, you know, and that, that sale included uh, uh, the transfer of the decommissioning fund for, for, for Guinea, as well as a 10-year power contract between RG&E and Constellation, or uh, for uh, the purchase of 90% of the plant's electric output. And presumably the rest of the power has been sold, uh, the other 10% has been sold on the market. Um, in 2004, uh, the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, federal agency, uh, approved a 20-year license extension for, for Guinea. Uh, Guinea was originally licensed to operate until 1969. Uh, the license extension uh, extended the operating license until 2029. Um, thing to understand about license dates is that uh, you know there's been about 20 nuclear reactors in the U.S. Uh, that have already that have closed, and every single one of them has closed long before uh, its license expiration date. So the license expiration date is you know uh, not does not is not really has not proved to be particularly relevant in terms of the actual lifespan of a nuclear power plant. Um, 
In 2006, uh, Constellation implemented what's called a power up rate, uh, which was basically a, a set of uh, extensive retrofits to the plant to increase its power output by about 17%. Uh, these have proved to be very expensive um, at a lot of power plants, and while we are not sure of the exact cost of the, the uprate for Ghana, it may, it may actually have been expensive enough to be contributing to some of the financial problems that the, that the plant experiences today. Um, then in 2010, uh, there was a series, there's been a series of um, complex ownership changes um, for Ghana. Uh, in 2010, uh, Constellation dissolved a partnership that it had with the French nuclear utility Electricité de France, uh, you know, through which they were planning to build new reactors in the U.S. Constellation backed out of that, and uh, rather than essentially, you know, uh, you know, sell its interest in, this, in the company to EDF, it gave EDF uh, a 50% stake in its, its existing nuclear power plants, including Guinea. Nine Mile Point One and Two, and a nuclear power plant in Maryland. Uh, and then in 2012, Constellation was acquired by Exelon, and so um, you know the unit um, that's half owned by Const by Exelon and EDF is still called Constellation Energy Nuclear Group. Um, but so now you know Guinea is operated by Exelon. That's sort of a requirement by federal uh, regulations on foreign ownership of nuclear power plants. Um, but you know, but EDF still essentially owns fifty percent of of, of Guinea, and we're not sure what role uh, EDF still plays in in the business decisions affecting the plant. Uh, so um, that said, so. Um, you know, there are these economic conditions that are facing the nuclear power industry, which is facing um, a, you know, two trends. One, where its costs are rising fairly dramatically as, you know, as electricity prices have fallen. And um, so the, you know, the, reason this, the basic reason for the rising costs is that the, you know, is that the nuclear generation fleet in the U.S. is aging. Um, it's been uh, you know over 40 years uh, since a new nuclear power plant was ordered in the U.S. There are a handful being built in the South right now at great expense, uh, but essentially um, you know there's been no new additions to the nuclear generation fleet in a very long time, and uh, the average age of plants is you know well over 30 years, um, approaching 35 years. Uh, Guinea is at the extreme high end of that, um, as I mentioned before, at, at 45 years. Uh, old, you know, it'll it'll be this year. Um, in 2012, the you know the average operating cost of a nuclear power plant in the U.S. rose to over 44 dollars per megawatt hour, or 4.4 cents a kilowatt hour. And you know, based on the the profile of the plant, whether it's you know how large the plant is, how how many reactors are you know are co-located on the site. Um, that varies a lot, and so for single unit reactors like Gene, it's over fifty dollars per megawatt hour. And this is all, by the way, industry data reported by the Nuclear Energy Institute, um, which is the trade association for the nuclear industry. Um, if you, when they broke it down in terms of uh, you know sort of the cost range, the operating cost ranges for different plants, uh, what they found was that the at the high end, uh, the average operating cost for the most expensive plants to run is, is over $60 a megawatt hour. And that is well above the market cost of electricity just about anywhere in the country. And Guinea would be within that profile of those most uh, uneconomical plants. Um, what, but what they've found is that you know, since 2008, the, these average operating costs have been rising by more than 5% per year, so well, well in, a, you know, in, a, in excess of inflation. Uh, so the nuclear industry itself is, is in a, you know, finds itself in a sort of crisis. And, um, you know, as part from any sort of short-term uh, losses over the last couple of years, the industry is really looking at this long-term trend in which uh, electricity prices are just not expected to rebound significantly. And, you know, as their costs are, are you know, are, are tending, are, are trending upward uh, pretty rapidly. So uh, what Exelon, as the nu largest nuclear power plant operator in the country um, has to undertaken sort of a national reform agenda in which it essentially you know is arguing that that electricity is just not expensive enough and and that electricity prices need to to, to rise in order to preserve um, you know what it feels are its valuable nuclear generation assets so it's undertaking a number of different things uh, first you know 
is to intensify um, the uh, the efforts to block renewable energy and efficiency programs. They're doing this both at the federal and the state level. Um, they're trying to build in market preferences uh, for the particular kinds of plants that they operate. You know, which are what are called baseload units um, that provide you know basically you know sort of inflexible. Uh, you know, constant generation capacity uh, that doesn't you know, respond well to changes in demand, but uh, but uh, you know, but that is a, sort of a twenty four seven type of operation. Um, they are also trying to create new kinds of subsidies for old reactors, including um, you know, sort of modifying what have been um, you know implemented as renewable energy standards uh, in in many different states, including New York. Uh, they're proposing to have those changed to clean energy standards. Uh, and to include nuclear in those, and they also want to uh, to create different kinds of emissions uh, regulation programs, uh, f- you know, that would essentially allow nuclear to be, you know, to sell credits to fossil fuel generators as a kind of emissions offset. Um, and then there, there's there's also states in which you know some of these proposals aren't going to fly, including most likely New York. Um, and so in those, in, in, you know, in these kind of situations, uh, you know, Exelon and, you know, and, and other nuclear power companies are, are basically resorting to uh, what we're seeing here at Ganae, which is these sort of subsidized, you know, kind of uh, what are labeled must-run contracts uh, for plants that are, you know, that they uh, deem uh, to be essential to provide for reliability in the electric system. To give a sense of what this looks like elsewhere, uh, Exelon is uh, undertaking a, um, sort of a dramatic effort in Illinois um, to make the case that it's you know where it operates eleven nuclear reactors there uh, for sub for a range of subsidies and incentives um, like those I just outlined. Uh, first, what they did in the beginning of last year was they blocked a bill that would that, that was necessary to fix the state's renewable energy standards um, because the state wasn't you know hasn't been able to meet its its targets for renewable energy uh, because of some flaws in the in the original legislation. Uh, Exelon blocked that bill uh, by threatening to close several of its several of its nuclear plants um, if the state did not first agree to subsidize them. Um, they then um, have demanded a combination of subsidies of uh, different types for the reactors, including the notion of clean energy standards, um, as well as you know these sort of emissions programs. Um, as and in, in addition to having lobbied for uh, for for these market reforms that will give that would give preference to their to their nuclear power plants. And uh, the net sum of, of what they seem to be angling for in Illinois is, um, you know, between these different subsidies and incentives, over a billion dollars per year uh, in these in these additional costs to ratepayers, which would effectively increase the cost of electricity by 38 percent in the state. Um, the state actually just um, completed some reports that were that were you know that Exelon had had you know had pushed through. Uh, to be done to to basically make the, try to make the case for for the things that it's proposing, and what was really remarkable um, was that you know despite being mandated to support uh, in a certain in a certain way to support Exelon's case, the state agencies you know, found remarkably little reason to do so. Um, they found that so, you know, the uneconomical reactors, in fact, were not necessary for reliability. Um, that there were uh, that they could be replaced at lower cost than what than the subsidies Exelon is asking for, and that in fact, if uh, the state opted to focus the replacement on um, clean energy options like efficiency and renewables, that it would actually cost less and 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 provide more jobs than those that would be lost through the retirement of the nuclear plants. So, in terms of uh, coming back to Guinea again. Um, the closure of the the, pot, the potential for Guinea's closure has actually been known for some time, um, at least since January of 2013, uh, when a number of Wall Street firms began publishing analyses of the industry that uh, that that had taken a closer look at the economics of these plants, and found that, and they actually reported that Guinea was one of the first uh, that would be in line for closure as soon as the the. The power, the power contract with RG and E expired in June of 2014. Uh, they estimated that between 2012 and 2013, uh, that Guinea would have lost about 43 million dollars, um, and <clears throat> that there would be sustained losses going forward. Um, you know that turned out actually to have. Uh, our UBS was basing those estimates on. Uh, on average uh, projections of nuclear operating costs. Um, and so the fact that Exelon is saying that it's lost more um, is probably representative of, of the, uh, the, you know, the real economics of, of Guinea going forward. 
Um, but in any case, uh, several several of these Wall Street firms reported the same thing that UBS did, that, that Guinea would be one of the first plants in danger of closing due to these economic trends. Um, and what's remarkable, um, you know, in light of that is that, uh, is that RG&E hadn't done more to anticipate uh, this happening and, and take some of the steps um, that it is now taking uh, proactively so that we didn't end up in this situation. So in terms of the contract proposal, um, so in, as I mentioned, in July of 2014, um, Exelon submitted a petition to the PSC after having met with um, uh, both the both the Public Service Commission and the NYISO, which is the um, the, the, not, the 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 entity that runs the the electricity system in New York, um, you know, Exelon had asked the ISO to uh, to do a reliability study, uh, which you know confirmed uh, that uh, the Guinea was going to be necessary to you know, to to keep the uh, the grid from encountering reliability problems going forward. Uh, they reported in this excellent reported in, in its petition to PSC that it had lost $100 million off running Guinea between 2012 and 2013. As I mentioned, that's over twice as much as, as what UBS estimated. Um, but in the in its petition, Exelon did not name a contract price that it thought would be necessary in order to in order to justify keeping Guinea going. Um, it did suggest that on top of uh, you know the contract satisfying the operating costs of Guinea. Uh, that it should uh, that it should get a, a, a basically a guaranteed rate of profit um, for the trouble of, of of running the plant. So um, you know, in light of the fact that the petition was so vague and that the, the, the PSC hasn't shed any light on on what they think um, the size of this of this contract would be, uh, we you know took the data that that we had, um, which you know seemed to be pretty reliable, to estimate essentially what 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 this contract is going to cost. We felt felt it was really important that the public and local officials know uh, what the what the impact of this thing might be and be able to prepare for it. Um, so we. Uh, you know, we took the data that we knew, uh, which is what the contract price was for Guinea's power with RG&E, uh, what the market prices were over the last couple of years, you know, uh, during the time period that Exelon said that it had been suffering these losses, and um, as well as, you know, adding in the amount that, that, our, that, uh, that Exelon says that it, um, it did lose at Guinea. And what that, uh, what that Produced was essentially an estimate of the operating cost of Guinea, which came in at fifty six dollars and seventy five cents uh, a megawatt hour, or about five point seven cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, this is again substantially higher than um, than uh, than the contract price uh, for the you know for the agreement with with RG and E, um, as well as and well above the market prices for electricity. Um, now, since since we published um, our estimates, Exelon has also indicated that it does, in fact, want to receive a guaranteed rate of profit uh, for running Guinea, and that it estimates that that uh, would result in a contract price of about $71 a megawatt hour. Um, that this is really an extraordinary, um, uh, you know, would be an extraordinary increase in the electricity costs for Rochester area ratepayers. Um, the, you know, even at the highest um you know, prices in the market in, in RG and E's territory, uh, which was in 2008, the, the average price for, for power that year uh, was, was only $63 a megawatt hour. So effectively, you know, this would be, you know, $71 would be over 10% higher than the peak year of electricity prices when ratepayers were really getting stung badly. Um, right now, that would be about 80% above what the recent market prices have been. Um, but even at the, you know, the basic you know, operating cost figure that we calculated, that's uh, over 43% above uh, what, the, you know, what, what the average market prices have been in recent years. So what does this look like in terms of the actual impact on ratepayers? We were sort of shocked to see the size of you know, essentially what would be a subsidy uh, to Exelon for continuing to run Guinea. Uh, which ranges, you know, from the, the just just for the basic operating costs of the plant, about eighty million dollars a year above the market prices of electricity, to up to one hundred and fifty million dollars a year if Exelon is successful in uh, in getting a contract that includes this eleven percent rate of return. Um, the impact on ratepayers would be especially um, would be especially difficult, ranging from about uh, eighteen dollars a month um, per customer. 
uh, that would vary a lot between, the, you know, whether you're a residential household or whether you're a business, um, to $34 a month um, at this high profit rate. Um, this is well in excess, as I, as I mentioned before, of the kind of contracts that are being given to keep other uh, what are being labeled must-run plants operational. Uh, there's the Dunkirk uh, coal plant in the Buffalo area, which the PSC has agreed to have ratepayers subsidize it to convert to a natural gas plant um, and continue to ostensibly operate profitably under with, with a new fuel. Um, that's about $150 million dollar uh, project um, over the ratepayers would pay for over ten years, um, and that would be you know in National Grid's service territory. There is substantially larger utility uh, than RG and E, so the average cu- average price to customers would be only about uh, eighty cents per month per customer. Uh, the Cayuga coal plant is uh, now undergoing a similar um, transition under a subsidy arrangement like the Dunkirk plant. Um, and that's at about $140 million total cost. Uh, that's in New York, State, New York State Electric and Gas's service territory. Um, apparently, as we understand it, um, you know, uh, the contract term for the Cayuga plant is about four years. Um, and then NYSEG's um, customer base is over twice as large as, um, as RG&E's. So, this, so the cost spread out in that way would be about uh, you know, $2.70 per customer. Um, as you can see, the you know because of the large annual amount of the subsidies for Gene, as well as RG&E's small customer base, um, the cost per customer is just you know in a, in a completely different league than with these other these other plants. So with that, I'll hand it back to Jessica. Thank you, Tim. Obviously, with the possibility of the Gene nuclear reactor closing, there are a lot of concerns, um, namely. If the reactor closes, will the lights go out? Will there be enough electricity available to keep up with power demand? Would we use more fossil fuels? This is a question asked by those of us who are deeply concerned about catastrophic climate change. And also, very importantly, what about the impact of the closure on the local communities surrounding the Gene nuclear reactor? So I'm going to discuss these questions. So the first question about whether the lights will go out. I just first note that the Public Service Commission process is designed to ensure that there is reliable electricity service in the RG&E service territory, and they are being very conservative about this. When Gene submitted its petition to the Public Service Commission asking for the subsidy to keep it open, It also submitted a reliability study that was done by the New York Independent System Operator, which is the entity that controls the bulk power market in New York, looking at whether there would be any reliability issues if the Gene nuclear reactor were to close. And that study did find, according to NISO, that if Gene were to shut down, there would be a reliability issue. And so that is the justification that Exelon is using to the Public Service Commission to get this rate hike. We think that this reliability study has not been done in a transparent way. It was done at the request of Exelon, and there was no public input into the way that study was done, the assumptions that were made, or what it would look like. So we've been asking the Public Service Commission to open that study up for more public review and to actually do an another independent study because we think that there are some issues with the underlying assumptions of that study, particularly the assumptions around peak demand in the Rochester area, which the study assumes will rise and continue to rise through 2018, when in fact peak demand in the Rochester area has been going down because of energy efficiency measures and demand response. So we think that that study actually shows the need for a lot more power than will actually be needed in the region, that issues should be looked at and the recent trends in peak demand should be considered when we look at whether we think there would be a reliability issue if Ghanai were to close. But nonetheless, the Public Service Commission is not going to let Ghanai close without ensuring that there is enough power generation and, and power supply in the area 
to meet the power demands of the Rochester area. As Tim mentioned, RG&E has proposed a transmission upgrade that it says will resolve any reliability issues that are that are pinpointed in that NISO study. These upgrades would allow more power to come from outside the region and make up the power supply um, if, if Guinea were to shut down. We don't know yet when that transmission upgrade would be ready. That will likely determine the length of the contract is when that transmission upgrade is in place. So the next question is, will we use more fossil fuels if if Guinea shuts down? I think this is a critical question, as I said, for those of us who are very concerned about catastrophic climate change. Alliance for a Green Economy has been very active in promoting renewable energy and energy efficiency and alternatives to fossil fuels in order to combat climate change. And we certainly would not like to see the closure of a nuclear reactor result long term in an increased use or dependence on fossil fuels. So we did do an analysis to look at long-term, what are the alternatives to Guinea? Is there the possibility that Guinea be replaced by no carbon or low carbon energy sources? And what we found in looking at the cost that this contract may be for um, Rochester area ratepayers, compared to um, wind and energy efficiency, Guinea is actually extremely expensive. And so as you can see, Guinea is likely to cost somewhere between $56 and $71 a megawatt hour. And we compared that to the cost of energy efficiency retrofits and unsubsidized wind. So energy efficiency retrofits, which means weatherization through insulation and sealing up drafts in your house, as well as replacing inefficient light bulbs and inefficient appliances with high efficiency light bulbs and appliances, all of those things are collectively referred to as energy efficiency retrofits. Those cost about $25 a megawatt hour. And wind costs about $50.74 a megawatt hour. So you can see that both of these alternatives are clean and carbon-free and much cheaper than Guinea. So if keeping Guinea open in order to prevent the increased use of fossil fuels is the argument you want to make, we can show that we can do that for a much cheaper price with cleaner fuels that also don't carry the other negative environmental impacts of a nuclear reactor, like routine radiological releases, thermal pollution in the Great Lakes, and the nuclear waste that we don't have a solution for and is likely to be sitting at the site indefinitely. Another set of issues that's often raised when talking about the potential closure of Guinea is the potential negative impact on the workers and the community that rely on the plant economically. So there are 600 to 700 workers employed at Guinea, depending on which source you consult. And those workers would be at risk of losing their jobs if Guinea were to close, and that's no small thing. And Guinea also pays the most recent figure I could find, about $10 million in property taxes to the town of Ontario and to Wayne County. And if the reactor were to close, then the property would be valued differently and and those taxes would very likely go down. And then finally, another set of issues pertains to the nearly 500 tons of nuclear waste that's on the site and that will need to be isolated from humans and the environment indefinitely. Preventing the loss of the 600 to 700 jobs at Guinea has been one of the most cited reasons for subsidizing the reactor by proponents of keeping Guinea open. But Providing a subsidy to Exelon to keep Guinea open is an extremely expensive way to retain jobs. Keeping Guinea open to retain jobs will cost between $393,000 to $574,000 per job. And so you can imagine that if you're really concerned about the impact of the closure on the workers, there may be a much less expensive way to protect the workers through severance packages that would cost ratepayers much less money. It's important to note here that it's not currently state policy right now, and there isn't currently a 
a process in place to use the Public Service Commission to force ratepayers to subsidize certain jobs in order to retain them. Since we have a competitive energy market in New York, absent a reliability need, any uneconomical plant like Ganesh should close, and the state shouldn't be forcing rg e customers to prevent job losses. But for those of us who care about seeing a just transition to a renewable energy system, I think it's fair to consider whether ratepayers want to put some money towards severance packages or wage replacement for workers who would lose their jobs when Guinea closes. It's also true that energy efficiency and renewables create many more jobs. So we did a calculation based on figures provided in a study by the University of Massachusetts, which gives figures for how many jobs are created in various energy industries for every million dollars invested. And so we took those numbers and we compared it to the jobs per million dollars it would cost to keep Guinea open. And as you can see, for the cost of keeping Guinea open with a subsidy, we would get between 1.7 and 2.5 jobs per every million dollar invested. And if you compare that to energy efficiency retrofits, which is seven jobs per million dollars invested, or wind and solar, which are 4.6 jobs per million invested and 5.4 jobs per million invested, you can see that if we were to move forward with cleaner alternatives to Guinea, we could also have a huge employment impact. And so the keeping Guinea open is actually a huge opportunity cost and preventing us from putting our money into cleaner alternatives that would also have a much bigger impact on the employment in the area. And then, you know, we also have to ask ourselves, what about the jobs that could be lost if electricity prices were to rise so high? Um, Certainly the impact on businesses and on municipalities is likely to be huge and there could be the potential for job losses there. No one has done that kind of economic analysis to try to determine how many jobs could be lost if rates were to go up so much, but I think it, it bears thinking about. Subsidizing Guinea is also not the best way to address the potential impact on the community in terms of the tax rates. Like I said, we believe that Guinea pays around $10 million in property taxes. And if you compare that to the $80 million to $100 million that Rochester area ratepayers may be asked to fork over in a form of a subsidy, just giving the town of Ontario and Wayne County $10 million for some number of years or some type of transition fund to help them mitigate the impact on on their revenues would be a much cheaper way of protecting these communities than um, subsidizing Guinea. And then finally, a good decommissioning plan is essential. We need to protect human health in the environment. And good decommissioning may also be a way to protect workers and, and retain jobs at Guinea. So going to hand it back over to Tim to talk about the risks and opportunities related to decommissioning. Thanks, Jessica. Um, Yes, so it's really important to think about what happens and to understand what happens after a nuclear power plant closes. And uh, that's the process of decommissioning. And, uh, you know, Exelon has, um, you know, been talking a lot about, uh, you know, essentially the closure of Guinea being a tremendously devastating impact on the local community, uh, as though all of the jobs at Guinea are going to go away uh, once the plant closes. And that is and that is certainly not the case. Um, although what happens, uh, you know, what form uh, the, the decommissioning process at Guinea takes place is, you know, is really up for grabs and could, um, you know, and th- there could be good or bad outcomes to that. And it's really important to, to understand what's involved and, and, you know, and what could be done to, to ensure the best possible outcome. So, um, you know, nuclear power plants are unique among industrial facilities in America. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, when, a, you know, uh, there's a process of decommissioning that's federally mandated um, to uh, to essentially, you know, guarantee that the the site is, um, you know, is cleaned up um, and managed in a, in, in a way that's, that's that's protective of the environment and national security. Um, 
so, um, but you know, this can be done in different in different kinds of ways and different kinds of time frames. And so, it's really important um, that uh, that people understand how this can work now and what opportunities there are to influence what happens. So, um, what's decommissioning? Uh, it's you know a federally mandated process regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, that involves you know the dismantlement of the reactor and the facilities on site, uh, the cleanup of residual radioactivity, the management of the nuclear waste um, that was that's been generated by GNA and for which there's uh, really no place to put it at the moment except to continue storing it on site. Um, and for all of this work, um, or at least for most of this work, for the dismantlement of the reactor and some of the cleanup, um, there is a federally mandated uh, decommissioning trust fund uh, that Exelon is managing that was originally uh, paid into by RG&E ratepayers to fund this work. And, um, and it's been invested over time, much like a pension fund, um, to accumulate value to pay for the eventual job of decommissioning. Uh, it hasn't accumulated to that point now, um, but uh, but that's one of the things that's important for the state um, and the local community to uh, to engage with. Um, the problem is is that decommissioning, um, you know, is virtually unregulated through a number of changes and uh, that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission made in the 1990s. Um, that uh, that really you know limit the amount of input and influence uh, the local community can have um, in you know the, in the NRC process, and so that's why it's really important for the for the community and for the state to be thinking ahead um, and figuring out how it can how it can best influence the decision um, you know now before you know before closure happens. Um, so a couple of the reasons why you know decommissioning can be so problematic in terms of the federal process is you know because the NRC now allows decommissioning to proceed you know with, with you know virtually no detailed plans um, it's, it's essentially you know allowed to be a you know a figure out as we go process um, and there's also very little inspection and enforcement by the NRC right now currently there's you know there's uh, there's two resident inspectors um, from the NRC. Who you know are at the plant site on a daily basis and you know able to provide you know some independent inspection and authority um, you know over safety regulations at the facility. Once decommissioning commences, uh, the NRC re resident inspectors go away, um, and there's very little opportunity uh, for the NRC to be engaged in the daily operations of what's going to happen at the site. Um, so. Um, that said, uh, you know there are some different there are different options under the NRC regulations for how decommissioning can proceed. Um, there are three basic options for you know for decommissioning. One the one is called uh, decon. It's essentially the rapid dismantlement of the of the site. Um, that's how the first several decommissionings of reactors in the U.S. were done. Um, you know, essentially, it's you know it um, you know it, it's a process that can be done within ten years. Uh, there's also a process called Safe Store, uh, which Exelon is likely to, likely to be talking a lot about, uh, which is a very loosely regulated um, option that essentially allows um, for the decommissioning to be completed any time within 60 years after the date that the reactor was closed. Um, that you know, within that 60-year time period, um, you know, the licensee is free to begin decommissioning at any point. Um, you know, but what Exelon typically plans for is to begin decommissioning 45 to 50 years after the plant closes, um, which poses, you know, its own risks in itself. There's a third option for decommissioning called entombment, which is basically exactly what it sounds like uh, and has never been done in the U.S., uh, but that essentially involves, you know, essentially encasing, uh, you know, the reactor you know, facilities and components within some sort of a, a protective structure that, you know, will guarantee that, um, you know, that, uh, that, you know, it'll, it'll remain isolated from the environment um, for a long period of time. Um, presumably, you know, it also involves restricting, you know, any future use of the site for different purposes until um, some unspecified future date when, when radioactivity levels, you know, might be considered uh, safer. Uh, but all, all three of these options have to have problems. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, decon, you know, rapid dismantlement is very dirty, dangerous, and expensive in the short term. Um, 
you know, there's the, the reactor components and facilities, um, especially the internal components, um, are extremely radioactive in the first few years after closure. Um, you know, it can be, you know, very dangerous, you know, both for workers and for the local community uh, to begin cutting apart the internals and, and you know, and commencing that level of dismantlement and, and cleanup, um, you know, with, within a few years after um, the reactor closes. Uh, one of the organizations that we work with, um, Citizens Awareness Network, um, has been an intervener in, in two decon decommissionings, um, you know, in communities where they have members and uh, there's been a lot of bad experiences with decon in terms of uh, you know workers ex- being exposed to excessive levels of radiation, um, releases of radioactive material from the site uh, with decon. Uh, Safe store has can have sort of the opposite problem, which is that essentially um, uh, you know the site is left to fester in its current state for decades. Uh, you know contamination on the site that you know isn't cleaned up now could begin to to migrate off site through groundwater or other mechanisms. Um, you know, and in the long run, uh, safe store is actually more expensive than decon uh, because uh, you know it. You know, while essentially the plant would be mothballed until decommissioning commences. Um, you know, there would be several million dollars per year of cost, you know, just for Exelon to maintain the reactor site and, and provide security, um, which would, as I mentioned, you know, cost, you know, substantially more than, than, a, than, than, than a more rapid dismantlement uh, would over time because of that. Um, then, you know, in terms of entombment, obviously, you know, the site remains a hazard to the community, you know, in perpetuity. Um, and, you know, can also, um, you know, in addition to posing environmental and health hazards because of, um, you know, the residual radioactivity that is just, you know, left there, um, you know, also, you know, affect the local economy by essentially being an eyesore or um, sort of a, you know, a, a depressing effect on property values and other, and other economic activity. Um, so, um, you know, in, uh, you know, communities you know, like those that um, the Citizens Awareness Network are in, have been advocating for better options. And essentially, um, uh, there's a good model for that, which has been used um, in at least one other reactor closure, um, as, as well as, um, you know, has, there's been an agreement reached to, to utilize a model similar to this in Vermont, uh, which is called Planned Decommissioning and Site Remediation. Um, this is an option that doesn't, you know, doesn't specify within the NRC's regulations, but that really, um, you know, is consistent with it and, and, you know, and can provide sort of a, you know, kind of a fourth pathway um, to provide for a better transition for the community. Um, the Rancho Seco reactor in California utilized a method uh, similar to this uh, when it shut down um, uh, in 1992, or the decommissioning process began in 1992. Um, the process can take 15 to 20 years, um, you know, uh, but with this ast- consistent level of, you know, of, of, and sustained effort of decommissioning at the, you know, at the work site, um, can retain 40 to 50% of the original workforce, um, and involves in the early years, um, a significant amount of, you know, basically surveying the site and, you know, analyzing, you know, the sort of what the cleanup needs are going to be while allowing some of the intense radioactivity in the plant to decay and making it safer for, you know, for both workers and for the community, you know, once decommissioning begins. Um, the state of Vermont um, just, you know, negotiated an agreement with Entergy Corporation um, for the for the decommissioning of the Vermont Yankee reactor last year. Uh, Vermont Yankee just closed in December, um, but the state negotiated an agreement um, through a similar process to what's going on with Guinea at the state level and the Public Service Commission um, to ensure a better result in the decommissioning. And I'll kind of walk through that in a minute. Um, but essentially, the, the you know the, the decommissioning deal in Vermont um, embodies the PDSR approach. Um, it you know begins with removing the nuclear waste from the spent fuel pool and securing it on site in, in, in safer dry cask storage. Um, and then beginning with um, the, the type of you know, site surveying and planning for decommissioning 
uh, for that to begin, you know, in a few years um, after the, uh, you know, with, 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 within a few years after closure, uh, potentially, you know, soon after the uh, soon after the the waste is removed into from from the fuel pools, um, and also the the Vermont agreement also included um, community development funds um, that Entergy would pay to basically help with the economic transition in the local community. Um, as well as uh, the establishment of a, of a citizen advisory panel um, to ensure some level of some consistent level of public information about what's going on and to enable the public to be involved in that way, as well as for the state and the local local officials to have an understanding of what's really happening uh, at the decom- you know during decommissioning and and be able to to take action if you know if if something is warranted. Um, so. That's really sort of a precedent-setting model for New York um, and other states, uh, where essentially, you know, because Exelon is a merchant, you know, mer- is a merchant power plant operator and isn't directly subject to state regulations anymore. Um, you know, the Vermont Yankee deal, you know, sets a good example of what the state could negotiate with, enter- you know, with, with Exelon um, through this process that we're that's going on right now with the uh, with with the power contract. Um, so in a certain sense, you know, now is really the opportunity for the state to act and to ensure that what happens after closure, um, you know, is going to be the best result for the community. Um, there's no other chance to make Exelon commit um, to doing some, you know, to to doing things in a different way than it might um, if you know if if Gennady just closes um, on X, uh, you know, on Exelon's own, um, you know, decision, uh, and then just only goes through the NRC process from that point forward. Um, the NRC process, as I mentioned, is basically fruitless in terms of, you know, opportunities for the public to really intervene in a meaningful way to structure what happens in the decommissioning process and uh, the legal options for, you know, for essentially suing uh, uh, Exelon or the NRC are quite limited. Um, as I mentioned, Vermont Yankee is a great, you know, is, is a good example for New York to follow. Um, how that happened was is that Entergy needed a permit from the state's utility board in order to continue operating for the last year and a half before Entergy announced that it, you know, before Entergy, you know, wanted to wanted to finally close the reactor. Um, the the governor and the attorney general and the public utility board were all involved in this um, in negotiating a settlement that covered uh, what happened, uh, you know, uh, that covered the decommissioning um, agreement, and it also provided an opportunity for workers and local officials to make their voices heard and, ha- and have a seat at the table to, um, you know, for the you know to inform the governor and the attorney general, uh, state, the state officials on what they sh- what they should negotiate. Um, you know, currently. You know, there's no agreement uh, with Exelon as to what will proceed in decommissioning, and um, and you know, and that means that the public, you know, would have no say in that um, if the state does not exercise the opportunity um, that it has now with this, you know, with, with this with the petition to the Public Service Commission to do that. So that brings us to what could be an alternative vision here for people in the RG&E service territory who are opposed to the continued operation of Guinea, either because they are concerned about the economic impact of this enormous rate hike or whether they are opposed to nuclear power for health and safety reasons and would like to see the plant shut down and decommissioned and for New York to move on to cleaner and greener alternatives. But people who are also concerned about the potential impacts of closure on the local economies and to the workers, we put together some calculations to look at what an alternative might be if Guinea were to shut down and we were to completely replace it with energy efficiency and wind, and if we were to add in some money from ratepayers to help mitigate the impact on the local economy and on the workers that would lose their jobs, those who would not be um, involved in the decommissioning of the plant. And so here's what we came up with. If we look at the combination of energy efficiency and wind, we see that we can get the power for um, an average of $34.78 a megawatt hour and create about 956 jobs in the process if we were to completely replace the output of Guinea with energy efficiency and wind. 
And then if we were able to negotiate a good decommissioning deal with Exelon that retained about 40% of the workforce, that would be another 240 jobs for a total of almost 1,200 jobs um, either retained or created through the replacement of Guinea with cleaner alternatives and a good decommissioning plan. And then we also built into this package some wage support for the workers that um, would be laid off, as well as $10 million a year in replacing the, the taxes that Exelon pays to the town of Ontario and Wayne County. This is an actual annual package. So the total cost of this package per year is um, $44.26 a megawatt hour, and again would create or retain about 1,200 jobs. And this cost would be between 22 and 38 percent below the cost of subsidizing Guinea. So we did this just to show that for people who are arguing that we cannot let the Guinea nuclear reactor close because we don't want to see the job losses at the reactor or we are worried about the tax impact on the local communities or we're worried about the potential increase in greenhouse gases. If we wanted to take care of all of those issues, it would still cost less to do that directly than to subsidize Guinea. So I just want to close this presentation by talking about what Alliance for a Green Economy is doing to sort of bring forth that alternative vision. We are involved as a party in the Public Service Commission proceeding on Guinea, and as a party we've been filing comments, and we've also had some meetings with the Public Service Commission and, and other state officials telling them about our perspective and, and our research and advocating for a just transition for the Rochester area. We've been demanding that the Public Service Commission delay approval of the contract once it's filed until alternatives are fully considered. We think that um, the time that was given for searching for alternatives to keeping Guinea open was extremely short. The RFP that RG&E put out only had a seven-week turnaround. So we've been asking the Public Service Commission to delay an approval until it really looks at alternatives and also takes a closer look at that reliability study to, to see really what the reliability needs are in the Rochester area so that we can tailor alternatives to the actual peak demand in the region. We've also been calling on the Public Service Commission to look into whether RG&E could bear some or all of the costs of the subsidy for Guinea because we think that this problem has come about in large part because RG&E failed to plan properly for the potential closure of Guinea. And we don't think it's fair to consumers that they be asked to bear the cost of poor planning on RG&E's part. And then we've also been advocating for the state to use the contract as leverage for a good decommissioning plan. As Tim mentioned, this really is potentially the last opportunity the state's going to have to negotiate a good deal on what decommissioning would look like at the plant. So we're strongly encouraging the Public Service Commission and the governor's office to use um, the contract that Exelon is seeking here as a leverage point for a good decommissioning plan. And then we're doing local education and organizing. So things like this presentation and reports that we've been putting out, which you can find on our website, agreenewyork.org. We've been doing to try to inform the public and, and help the public have a say in this process. And then there are things that you can do if you would like to see the Guinea nuclear reactor shut down and avoid this ratepayer subsidy for Guinea, or if you have any other comments that you want to submit to the Public Service Commission, we encourage you to do that. They are taking comments on this case, and you can tell them what you think about it. You can also join our email list to stay updated on this issue. We will be putting out information as it comes to us. Um, we also encourage you to contact your local officials and tell them what you're concerned about and ask them to get involved, to write letters 
and to write letters to the editor of your local paper to inform your friends and neighbors and to get your opinion out there. So for more information, I would just encourage you to visit the Alliance for a Green Economy website, agreenewyork.org. We have a comment form there as well as links to the Public Service Commission proceeding and all the documents that have been filed in the case, and that's also where you can join our email list. So thank you very much for tuning in to this presentation, and we look forward to hearing from you.